All right, I'm going to invite you to sing along. You call us out from the depths. You call us out from the depths into your freedom. Our chains are gone. And no weapon form shall prevail. Your word is stronger. We overcome. through the age all saints declaring your great renown your kingdom forever will stand we won't be shaken we will not fear our God a mighty warrior you're a consuming fire the great commander you conquered death forever in victory you reign we triumph in your name we'll sing it again your glory resounds through the age your glory resounds through the age all saints declaring your great renown and your kingdom forever will stand we won't be shaken we will not fear our god a mighty warrior you're a consuming fire in victory you reign we triumph in your name jesus the great Well, happy 2020. We're glad you're here. And uh, it's a new year, a new start. Uh, you can have a seat. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Mia Schmidt. 
that I'm no longer an intern, but I am still a youth leader here at Hope, and I am super excited that I get to be your announcement host today. If you're new today, thanks for joining us this morning. We would love to meet your cool self here in the Connection Center following service. Just fill out your Connect card and bring it with you. See you there. As you've likely heard by now, Jason Gray is coming to Hope on January 12th at 6 p.m. for a free concert. That's in just six days. This concert will take the place of our normal 6 p.m. service and there will be the opportunity to give a free will offering to the HC Community Care Center and Food Pantry. You know, I actually got to meet Jason Gray when I was in high school and he is such a nice guy. Did you know that he was born with a stutter, but through singing he was able to find his voice and worship God through it all? What an amazing story of how God can work through difficult circumstances. We hope to see you join us in worship at this concert on January 12th. With the new year, we've got a lot of new activities coming up. We want to remind you that Wednesday night programming, such as classes, Hope Youth, and Hope Kids, resumes this upcoming Wednesday, along with Growth Track, a four-part series designed to help you grow spiritually. I personally went to Growth Track and loved it. For the month of January, Growth Track will take place on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. starting this Wednesday. You can sign up for Growth Track on the app or on our website today. New sessions of support groups will also start back up this Thursday and adult Sunday classes start back up next Sunday, the 12th. Check out our app and website to see the different support groups and classes that we offer. Lastly, today, mark your calendars for the annual Super Bowl party on Sunday, February 2nd. While I'm not even quite sure who will be playing this year or who's playing now, I have no doubt that this event is going to be a blast. So whether you're a super sports fanatic or if you couldn't care less, all are welcome to join us at 4.30 p.m. on Super Bowl Sunday for appetizers, games, and a good time. Feel free to bring a food item to share. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Lucky for you, to get all of those dates and times, you can check out our Hope Church app where you can see all of our upcoming events. If you haven't downloaded it yet, just text GF Hope app to 77977. Speaking of the app, one of my personal favorite features is the sermon notes sections, where you can keep tabs on all of your notes during the sermon and you can have them for your reference if you ever want them in the future. You know, just in case you ever misplace your paper notes, like I always do. Well, it was my pleasure being your announcements host today and I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Have a superb week, everybody. Oh, I love Mia, she's awesome. She brings a nice energy to that, doesn't she? <laughs> I want to invite you to stand, and our hope and our prayers that you would worship with us. We're not here to entertain. We're not here uh, for, you're not here for us. We're here to worship God, so let's tune our hearts into him. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into songs, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the Oh, hi.
our circumstances we choose to praise you and we step into it it's amazing to come together and to worship the one who has put breath into us who breathes life to, into us moment by moment and that's just our opportunity to worship him I invite you to sing this with me give life to our love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your Your breath in our lungs. 
praise Him, even the rocks cry out. have given us life, abundant life, your scripture says, and you've uh, given us this new year to be the ones that would proclaim, be the ones that would stand on your word, to the ones who would worship and praise in the middle of not only the good times, but the hard times. Because we know that you will not fail us. You will not reject us. You have a great plan for us. And you have given us the path that will lead through all eternity to be in your presence. What a gift. Pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give God a round of praise. Hey, Happy New Year. Isn't that cool? This is 2020, y'all. Who knew we'd make it? Uh, you can be seated. Hey, I, I just want to mention a couple quick things. Uh, at the end of the service, for some of you are going to think about this during the sermon, and you're thinking, you know, I want to discuss this with some people. Right? So we're going to have an opportunity. You can come up here and at the end of the service on this side of the room, and we're going to form some like ad hoc groups during the week, and you can discuss it. We have a Facebook page where you can discuss the sermon and some other opportunities. You come up here, and we'll help you figure that out. Follow our app, and we'll have some more information on there. And it's, there's going to be some pieces in the sermon for the next four or five weeks that you're going to think, I want to talk these out. And uh, it'll be wonderful. There's questions on the back of your sermon notes also that you can use to help prompt uh, even in your own discussion or discussion around the table uh, for dinner. Uh, the other thing I, I want to say is in the new year, like I'm not a new year resolution guy, but there's some things I want to do. <laughs> I guess those are resolutions, right? Uh, but I'm not going to call them resolutions because when I mess up on them, then I feel like I failed on my resolution. If I'm practicing something and I miss a note while practicing, I just pick it up and practice some more. Right? So maybe some of you are going to want to practice uh, like hearing God's word. We put a little insert in there. Did you know that over half of the books of the New Testament you can listen to in less than 20 minutes, 25 minutes? 
Like if you go to your version Bible, you can hit the app, the part of the app where it speaks to you. And while you're driving, you can close your eyes and just listen to, <laughs> okay, you can like listen while you drive and you can, like, like the book of Jonah, it's 10 minutes. You can just listen to the whole book of Jonah and you can do that six or seven times this week. Just listen to the whole book. And so we have a little guide there of all the books of the Bible. And, and some of you, there's some other things that you're going to be prompted on probably today and say, you know, let's work on that or let's work on this. Don't let condemnation be heaped on you, but the opportunity to live the best life possible living according to the way God's designed it. So we're going to take our morning offering. If you're a guest with us, please don't feel obligated. Let's host you in the presence of God, a God that we believe loves you and us very much. If you're a regular attender here, uh, go crazy, give big, start your year out with massive trust in God. Amen.
Go ahead, give God praise. So here's the deal. God has designed a beautiful life for us. He's designed amazing life. He's designed an abundant life for us. That's what he wants for us. That's what he dreams for us. And when we run away from that, he'll move heaven and earth to try to bring us back to him. Because we have a God that runs after us. He wants us to live in the goodness of his love and grace and mercy. And we step out of that. You can expect storms. It is not just a fish story. There is so much more to this book. I have absolutely fallen in love with it. I, I can honestly say I hadn't really spent much time in it up until the last couple of weeks. And I've been listening to it over and over and over. I've been reading about it. This is, this is a story about, uh, about God's compassion. It's a story about God followers, people who are devoted to God, running from him and disobeying him and living outside of his desires. It's a story about God moving heaven and earth to bring one back. It's a story about a God who cares so much about lost people that he will send his children into that fray to help them discover the good news. It's a story about nationalism. It's a story about racism. It's a story about, well, it's not really a story about a fish, really, but for some of us, we get caught up. We get caught by the fish. Right, 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 right. Some of us get so hung up on that, so netted up on that, get, get the fishing illusions there. We, we get so messed up on the fish story that we lose the whole context of what it's about. The fish is just a little piece of it. And some of us think that's the whole story. That's the, the flannel graph. That's the little piece of, of kindergarten or, or children's Sunday school that we learn. But there's so much, much more in the story. It, it's about God. It's about you and it's about me. Now, let me just make a comment. While you're turning to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, there's Bibles in the chairs for you. The book of Jonah is the eighth book from the end of the Old Testament. So if you go to the New Testament, count eight books back, uh, you'll find the book of Jonah. And if you have your app on your phone, you can just like tap and it'll bring you to the, or you could just say, Siri, bring me to the book of Jonah. I found this on the web. Thank you. Okay, so you can do whatever you need to do to find the book, but here's what I'm begging you to do. Like, use your notes and, and come and let's learn, let's dig deep, because this isn't a book for people who don't know Jesus yet. I mean, it, it, for those of you who don't, like, it'll help you, but this is a book for living faithful to the God that we say we are in love with. And so I want to uh, encourage us to do that. It, it's four chapters, 53 verses, 10 minutes of reading. So while you're still looking for the book, let me tell you about the fish. Right? The story goes like this, that Jonah was thrown overboard and he was swallowed by a great fish. It does not say a whale. Right? The Bible doesn't say a whale. The Bible never said it was a whale. Stop saying it was a whale. It wasn't a whale. Right? But some of us, like, we, we get all hung up on us trying to figure out how it happened. Let me tell you something about, like, like I don't know how it happened. I wasn't there, right? I, I don't know how he survived, but the miracle isn't that the fish swallowed Jonah. The miracle is that he survived. The miracle is that he didn't drown. The miracle is the provision of God. But here's where I come down on this. Jesus, the one who I've surrendered my life to, the one who I believe is my Savior and Lord, he told about the story about Jonah and the fish. It seemed like Jesus believed it. Right? And the greatest miracle isn't about the fish. The greatest miracle, as I read it, is that Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, and buried. And the third day he rose again from the grave. 
And if you can get your head around the resurrection miracle, the fish is no big tail. Right, because that's an amazing story. That's an amazing truth. And if that's not true to you, if you, if you can't believe that, you, you, like there's a whole bunch of other things. I would, if you can't believe the resurrection, then I don't expect you to believe the fish story. But what I'd encourage you to do is figure out the resurrection because if you figure out the resurrection, if you can believe that in faith, then the rest of this is just like minnow size. So here's where I am. I believe Jonah was followed by a fish. You may think I'm crazy. You may think I'm immature. You may think I'm silly. I'd rather die silly and trust Jesus because I actually believe he rose from the dead and the rest of it is just like minnow size belief. So let me read Jonah chapter one and I'm gonna read from uh, the New International Version of the Bible and we're gonna read this whole book, right? Uh, not not to this morning, just relax. But I'm going to read the first 16 verses. The 17th verse I'm going to save for the end of the message, right? Because uh, there's so much in here. And we're, we're going to discover some lessons for us who are followers of Jesus Christ. Let's stand in honor of God as we read his word. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he, lay, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Let me stop for a second. Isn't that ironic? He's running from God. He's hiding in the bowels of ship. He's sound asleep in depression and fear escaping. When they ask him, who are you? I'm a Hebrew. Never mind how I'm acting. I'll say with my lips who I am, but I won't live it with my life. That's what he's doing. By the way, this story isn't just about Jonah, is it? It's about us. Okay. Uh, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running from, away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea. I'm running so hard, it'd be okay if I die, is what he's saying. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let this, us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, for you have done, we have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. I'll save the last verse for later. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you'd speak to us. I pray, God, that this word would come alive to us. God, I pray that you'd yank this story out of children's tales out of fish tails, 
bring it to our hearts and our lives so that we can learn from the prophet who ran from you. Amen. You can be seated. So I, I want to weave out four lessons about running from God, fr- from, from this man who was a runner, lessons from a runner. And, and Tim Keller calls, uh, Tim Keller, the preacher from New York, calls Jonah the prodigal prophet, the prophet who was running. So, but let me, let me say this. You know that this is a story about people who are in relationship with God, right? Jonah was a follower of God. This is a story about hearing something from God and disobeying it. Hearing something from God and running from it. Here's the first lesson. God still calls us and we still choose. God still calls us and we still choose. That the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Jonah, who was a prophet, who worked and served God. He was a servant to God. He was faithful to God in most contexts. And this story is about him hearing and understanding and choosing to not obey. It's a story about Jonah hearing and understanding and choosing to disobey. It's a story about Jonah rising to go, but going the opposite direction of what God wanted him to go. It's the story of God calling on Jonah to do something on his behalf and Jonah not doing it. It's the same kind of deal as many of the people of uh, of God. Abraham resisted God. Moses resisted God. Sarah resisted God. Jeremiah resisted God. The apostle Peter resisted God. You and I have resisted God. Jonah isn't that much unlike us. But there's some amazing lessons here. By the way, some of us, when when we think about this, this idea of, 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 of like obeying God, I've actually thought this. God, why don't you just say it out loud? Because like Jonah, like, like, I don't know, did you all hear God speak out loud? Because I've never in my entire life heard him. I've, I've heard him speak, I believe. But I've never heard him speak out loud. And, and I've thought at times, I would be more obedient if he would just say it out loud. And I'm thinking, you know, probably back then, some of these folks probably said, you know, God, if you would just write it down for us, then we could save it, then we could, you know, not play tricks on our heads. If, 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 if we had it written down, God, we could look at it and examine it and we'd be more faithful. I can imagine them saying that. And we're here saying, God, like if you would just say it out loud, I'll for sure remember and be faithful. See, we hear from God all the time. We hear the voice of God in the words of God all the time. Matter of fact, some of us have been in a situation where the word of God has been so powerful that it felt like the hand of God pushed it into our hearts and minds. Some of us have heard the word of God so clearly that we know that he wants us to do thus and so. And we still choose to not. And we have all these excuses, all of these reasons why, why we don't. And, and really, what, what, like, like we have all of these reasons why we don't obey God financially. Oh God, it's 2020. That's old fashioned. We, we have all these reasons why we don't obey God relationally. Why we don't do our marriages the way he describes it here. We have all kinds of reasons, right? Like, they weren't married to my wife. If they were married to my wife, they'd understand why I disobeyed, or my husband, right? We, we have all these reasons why we don't forgive the way he talks about forgiving. We have all of these reasons why we don't tell our friends about the love of Jesus. Like he calls us to tell about the love of Jesus. We have all kinds of reasons. Here, let me just remind you who Jonah was talking to. Jonah was talking, and I'll talk more about this next week. Jonah was talk, sent to Nineveh. Nineveh was a great city. Nineveh was part of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire is what we would call today an evil empire. They were crazy evil. Like they had perfected, when they captured people, they had perfected the skill of tying up their arms and their feet and filleting them alive so that they could capture the skin, hang it on the city walls, and keep the guy alive for a period of time while he bled to death. 
That was a thing. That's who God says, Jonah, go tell them about my love and grace and my compassion. Tell them that their wickedness has arisen to me and, and, and that they should repent. Jonah, Jonah go. <laughs> Are you kidding me? They'll flay me alive. And so Jonah has really good reasons to disobey. Maybe, maybe even better than some of the reasons we have for our disobedience. See, disobedience to the call of God where we make the choice, really what it boils down to, it boils down to I won't trust you, God. Like, and we say this, we say this. I'll trust you and surrender my life to you to receive your forgiveness so that I can go to heaven and live eternally with you, but I'm not going to trust you for my marriage. I'll trust you for my eternity and my eternal salvation so that I can walk along the streets of gold and look at the pearly gates and sing in heaven, but I'm not going to trust you with my finances. I'll trust you, God, with my whole being and forgiveness, but my sexuality belongs to me. God, I'll... And that's what Jonah did. Jonah was a prophet of God. And he ran. Luke 6, verse 46 to 48 says this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They're like a man who builds a house, who dug down deep and laid a foundation on the rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was so well built. God has this beautiful, amazing plan, this wonderful plan for the abundance of our life, and he's saying, stay on the path. Don't run from me. And so he's given us our, his, his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all scriptures God breathed. It's, it's like God spoken. God breathed. It's used for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training righteousness so that the person of God, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work so that everything he calls you to do, he teaches, he teaches us how to do marriage well. He teaches us how to do relationships well. He teaches us how to do finances well. He teaches us how to do sexuality well. He teaches us how, how, to, how to live well together in community. He teaches us all this stuff right here. Your word is like a lamp to my feet so I won't stumble along the way. Your word, the word is a light to my path. Your word is living and active. It's like your very words, God. That's what he's saying. And I'm saying, God, you know what I'd like? I'd like you just to talk to me. And I think sometimes God says, why would I talk to you when you won't even obey what I've written to you? First lesson is God still speaks. I really believe that. He prompts us with his Holy Spirit. He speaks to us from his word, and we still choose by, by the way, how, how, where are you choosing or not choosing? Where, where are you obeying or not obeying? I know some of us, like, some of us, uh, we don't, like, disobey blatantly. We disobey internally. We look so amazingly, beautifully Christian. Right? Like, we've worked, we've worked it out so that everybody sees how really good and moral we are. And that's not the deal. The deal is relationship with the Father. The deal is a heart that's developed in love with God, not just playing a part. Okay, second lesson. Number two, second lesson from a runner that we see in the life of Jonah, fleeing God is just fooling ourselves. Fleeing God is fooling ourselves. Let me, let me read the passage. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. Think about that for a second. Those of you who know a little bit of theology, right? Think about the irony of the statement, and Jonah ran away from the Lord. Where do you go to run away from God? It's like playing with my grandkids. We, we'll play hide and seek sometimes, and I'll be in the room, and then I'll run and hide and end up back in the room where they are. And they're like, right? Or, or they'll run and I'll already be in the place where they're going to because I know where they're going to go. I'll, 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 I'll be everywhere. Like I'll sneak around the house and be there before they get there when they're looking for me when they think I'm there. And I'm there. I'm everywhere. 
Not really. But God is. God's everywhereness is always there. God's everywhereness is always there. It's foolish to think that we can flee from God. There's nowhere you can go. There's nowhere you can hide. You can run, but you can't hide. Even, David writes, even if I bury myself in the deepest part of the darkness, there you are with me. Now, if you're trying to run from God, that may not be a comfort but if you understand the context of who God is, if you understand him as a father, if you understand him as a compassionate God, that's an amazing comfort. When we look at this story for the next several weeks, you can look at the storms, you can look at the fish, you can look at all the stuff as punishment, or you can look at it as provision. If you look at it all as punishment, then, then bummer for you, because then you know a different kind of God. But if you look at some of these things like the storm and the fish and, and, and the heat, and all, if you look at that as God's provision for you to help move your heart onto the path where he dreams of it being, then this is an amazing story of God's compassion and grace and mercy. But you can't actually hide from God. It's foolishness, right? You, 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 you can run, but you can't hide. Here's, some, here's a verse that used to scare the wits out of me. It's Numbers 32, 23. Numbers 30, you can write it down, Numbers 32, 23. It says, but if you will not do so, this is talking to Moses, right? If you will not, or Moses is talking to the tribes of Israel about going into the land. If you will not do so, you have sinned against the Lord. It, it, it's like this, God has laid out this beauty for them. And he's inviting them in and they're saying, you know, we'd rather stay back here. And they're choosing not to, to enter into the beauty, which is all of life, right? They think, well, we'll, we'll be better off here, thank you. But they, they actually decide to go. But, but what he says is, be sure your sin will find you out. Like Just let that ponder and, 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 and come over you like a wave for a second. That, that all of the secret stuff, be sure your sin will find you out. Here's what I figure. We ought to just confess up front and get it over with rather than hide. You know one of the things that I think is foolish? I never used to think, actually a pastor, another pastor named Chris Brown helped me see this. Let me, let me tell you, so Jonah is down at the port. He wants to catch a ship. He checks out this ship and it's going to Tarshish. He has enough money now. He can buy the fare. The ship has room. That's like an amazing open door. And it would be a wonderful thing except for verses 1, 2, and 3 in chapter 1. That he's actually got that open door, but he's running from God. There's certain times in our lives where there's an open door before us, and it's foolish to walk through it, even though you might feel like all of it's all set in order for you. Because in the background, you know you're doing that doorway because you're disobeying God. You may look, and you may pretend yourself, and you may fool yourself, say, look at God provided a ship for me. But if you already know you're being disobedient, I could promise you he didn't provide that ship, even though there's room for you, even though you have enough money, even though all of the other pieces seem like it's a wide open door. Let me tell you a story. I was sitting in my office and this lady was in there. I've told this story before, but it's, it's like this prime example for me of this. This lady's in there and she's got this guy with us and she's explained to me how he is her soulmate and how she's so excited that she finally found her soulmate. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, no. And she says, this is, this is like perfect. We love each other. He prays with me. He reads scripture with me. He's my soulmate, Pastor Paul. I'm so excited. I said, what's your husband think about that? True story. And she said, I haven't told him yet. But this is perfect. And I said, you know what? It's not it may seem, you may be fooling yourself into something that is beautiful. But I promise you, it's not the will of God if you have to disobey God to get to that perfect thing. Ever. Jonah has the perfect transportation. He thinks. It's a wide open door. But it's going to wreck his life. Just let that soak in. It doesn't have to be in the context of marriage. It doesn't have to be in the context of a soulmate. It, but, but somewhere along the line, God's probably telling you, that's not the plan. It may make all kinds of sense to you right now, but it goes against what I've told you. 
It's foolishness to think that your way is better than God's way. It just is. It's foolishness to think that if you operate your finances the way you want to operate them and ignore the way God wants you to operate them, that, that it's going to go good for you. It's foolishness to think if you run your marriage and your family life the way you want to run it and ignore the principles of God. It's foolish to think that God has a better, a lesser plan for your sexuality than you do. It, it's foolishness to think that the way you deal with your enemies is better than the way God wants you to deal with your enemies. Because it boils down to that, that we don't trust him. See, that, that, Luke chapter 15 talks about the prodigal son, and there's two sons there. Right? There's the son who ran away and did wild, horrendous things, and then there's the son that stayed home who did everything right. Neither of them, neither of them had a heart that was devoted to God. Both of them were living the foolish lifestyle, thinking their way was better than God's way. The stay-at-home brother was looking to part without a developed heart. I think I'm safe saying that's the way a lot of us live. We actually aren't running on the outside. But we are so locked up on the inside in the bowels of a ship that we think we're in charge of. And we're not. Third lesson. This third lesson is, uh, it's going to be obvious when you hear it, but it, for some of you when you hear it, and, and I, I want to be careful, it's going to be more painful than I intend maybe. Because uh, I think God's going to remind us of some things that are true. And, and again, I, I, I want us to hear, I don't think God is a God of punishment, but I also don't think he removes all the consequences of our stupid are running. So here's the third lesson. For those that run from God, there's always a cost. There's always a cost to running from God. That cost is often to others as well. And that hurts. Like I look around and I visit with people and I watch people's lives and I, I've been in this church now for 28 years so like I've seen some of, some of us grow up I've been a follower of Jesus since I was about 13, so I've, I've got like a, a while to have observed this. And I think it's pretty much true that the sins of the fathers and mothers will visit the sons and daughters, right, if we don't like right the course of the ship. That things happen generationally because of environment or circumstances or whatever, that if we don't turn a ship around and head back towards God, that we live the consequences Right, listen, listen to this. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose. Now, now you can look at that as punishment, and, and there, there, there's consequences to this, but I actually think the violent wind was a gift because his heart is for the lost. God's heart is for the lost and for getting people who love him on the right path with him rather than running from him. And so these horrendous consequences, sometimes, whether they're sent from God or not, I don't always know, but what I do is they're meant... They're meant to help us pull back and reevaluate. Let me start over. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw, a cargo into the sea. they threw their cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Look, look what's happening here. The sailors are seasoned men on the sea. They, they're, they're not afraid of a normal storm. This is a violent storm. This is a storm come out of nowhere. This is a storm that they end up saying, this must be something of the supernatural. This is a crazy storm. We're terrified. And they do this. They start doing this. They start doing the same things many of our families do when we start doing things that are crazy, when we start wrecking the provisions around us, when we start taking advantage. They do the same thing. They start throwing over things of value. They start taking their cargo. The cargo represented the very thing they were on the sea for. They were bringing the cargo from one port to another so they could get money or paid so that they could support their family, support their kids, support their homes, support their work. They were doing, they, the cargo represented their livelihood. And because of the sinfulness of somebody, they're taking that livelihood and they're throwing it overboard. That's what happens in our families. When people in a family cover for someone who's destroying things. That's what happens when, when people 
hurt each other and you surround that person with protection or you surround that person in a way just to save people's lives. It may be the right thing to do, but it's still costly. And here's the amazing thing. It's Jonah's sin, not theirs. And they're paying the price. And Jonah is stinking sleeping in the bowels of the ship. He's escaped. He's doing what many of us do when we've lost our spiritual courage. He's doing what many of us do when we've lost our spiritual metal. We hide and sleep in our beds with our blankets over our head and we pretend that it's all going fine. We escape. And the family's going down to the bottom of the sea. Timothy Keller says every act of disobedience to God has a storm attached to it. And here's what, here's what some of us are fooling ourselves with. Well, thank God I haven't got into a storm yet. And, and, and you do, some of you are, are doing that right now. You're, you're thinking that your sin, that you've been managing it pretty good and it's, there's no big storm. You have no idea. There actually may be a hidden storm. There may actually be a hidden cost that you're paying. You just don't realize it. That if God's intention was something beautiful and wonderful and amazing for your life, and it's being withheld because you're running the other way, not towards that beauty, you have no idea what you're missing. You have no idea what's going to happen as your family grows up around you, and they live in the kind of environment where you've resisted God with your life in certain areas. You have no idea how that's going to affect. It's this hidden cost that, 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 is, that you're paying daily for. I don't think this story is true, but I was told this story when I was in, in high school. It's a story about me going to heaven. Right? I get up to heaven, and, and God's showing me around in all the beauty because I'm, I'm saved by grace, right? Not by my behavior, not by my, but, I, but I'm saved. But there's things in my life where I've squandered that grace of God, where I've chosen to turn my back on God. And so the story is, I'm up in heaven. Right? God's showing me around, and I keep coming back to this one door, and I say, what's behind that door? And he says, it's fine, Paul. Just look at the beauty of it. What's behind that door? And I keep asking, which is what I would do. Right? Even if God said, don't ask about that door or that door. And I'd say, why is the one door off limits? What's behind that door? And God would say, Paul, stop. For 80 years, I've been telling you to stop. Just, but, but, but God, what? Right? And so here's, here's how the story goes. Later on, one of the other disciples comes up. Okay, Paul, I'll show you what's in the door. It's not true. And I don't think the disciples go behind God's back or anything like that. But, so the disciple opens up the door, and there's all of these amazing things. I go, what's that? He goes, well, those are the things God wanted to do for you that he couldn't because you weren't on the path. And all the times you chose to turn your back on him, those were blessings he wanted to give you. I don't know if that's true. I don't think, I don't, I don't know if God, but I think there are things, hidden costs, of things that God can't do with us because we've chosen not to let him. Here's the final lesson. There is a difference between saying who you are and being who you are. There is a difference, you guys. They asked Jonah, where are you from? Who are you? What people are you from? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew. It's like someone sitting at work and, and, and you're involved in something. And, so, so who are you? I'm a born-again Christian. That's who I am. And you act like you belong to hell. And that's what Jonah's doing. He's saying, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And I'm scared stiff on the sea right now because I'm not trusting God. And I don't want to go on the land because that's where he wants me to be. And I'm running like crazy. So I'm not really, really, really worshiping. And I'm sound asleep in the bells of the ship. It's one thing to say who you are. It's another to be who you are. 
God's more interested in you being who you are than just saying who you are. There's nothing wrong with saying who you are if it's authentic and it is who you are. There's nothing wrong with not measuring up to who you want to be. It's just being honest that you aren't who you want to be yet, that you're living up or growing up into who you are. Right, that God says you're holy and blameless, that God says you're amazing, God says you're wonderful, God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and, and you're, you're living in the bottom of a ship, running from him. And God's, God, that's still true. And God wants us to step out of the ship onto dry land, let the sh- fish vomit you to safety, and start living who you are. It's not about being perfect. It's not really about the behavior. It's about the heart. It's not pretending to be doing your part. It's asking God to develop your heart so they can be who you are. Where are you declaring something that is true and not living it? I think this story is amazing because you notice in chapter one, who's praying? The pagan sailors, the people who don't follow God, they're following whatever God they can find. They're the ones praying. Jonah doesn't utter a prayer in chapter 1. The ship is going to the bottom. The guy who knows God doesn't even talk to him. Who's doing doing all they can to try to save the ship? It's not the God follower. It's all the people who know nothing about God. They're actually incredibly kind men. They're like debating, how can we save his life and still save the ship? We'll try to roll back to shore to save everybody. And, and, and Jonah's like, doesn't have any part of it. They're, 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 they're like, God, do something, trying to do the right thing in the story. God, don't hold it against us if we throw him overboard. He wants us to kill him. He's choosing suicide by sea. God, we're doing our best. You know what I think is interesting? When I run across Christians who in their arrogance assume that all the people who don't know Jesus Christ yet have nothing to offer. It is the very pagans here who are doing the right things. So I don't know which one of these points grabbed you or which one of these God spoke to you about. But I wonder if maybe even while you are at work and you're watching all of the unbelievers around you try to do nice things and it enters into your mind and says, yeah, what a waste of time. They're not, they, they don't know Jesus. I wonder if you would wake up and realize that maybe God has you on that ship called your place of work or your family where all of these people are trying to figure out how to live the best life possible, maybe even seek God. Like when you see someone at work reading a, a, a book that is full of untruths, and you know it, but it's a book where they're trying to seek something of God. And rather than be silent or stay spiritually sleeping, why don't you step in and begin to live who you are? So let me end with this. They throw them in the sea. The sea becomes calm falling down in the waves. Jonah. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The miracle is he's still alive because God has a plan for him just like you. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. The Lord Jesus was gathered with his followers, his disciples, those that he loved, those that he had come for, those that he believed were worth dying for. He, they were celebrating the Passover meal, the meal where the people of Israel were set free through the blood of the Lamb. He took bread off the table and he raised it up to his father. And he asked his father to bless it. And then it says that he broke it. And he passed it and each one took a piece. In the same way, he took a cup. And he raised it up to his father. And he asked his father to bless it. And he said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. So he, let me just say this. There's a lot of pieces of that message I'm assuming like grabbed some of us and made us feel like incredibly sad for some of our past. God is a God of forgiveness. And he's a God of restoration. We, we may be living some of the consequences, but we can turn the ship around because God invites us always to turn back toward him. I beg you do that. The Lord's Supper is a reminder that he died for us. Because we deserve to die. But he loved us that much. So maybe as you're taking communion, or maybe even before you take communion, or maybe right after, let's do it before. Let's rehearse with God again the areas where you need forgiveness and just say thank you for dying for me please forgive me for my whatever that is Late in darkness, a battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, stone was rolled away, this perfect love could not.
said this is my body given for you take and eat this cup is a new covenant of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin just think about that for a second before you drink it if you have Jesus you have forgiveness. Take and drink. In the book of Romans, it says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This isn't a message about condemnation. It's a message about getting on the path so you can live in the full blessings of his kingdom. If you're a person that doesn't know Jesus yet, your first step is to bend your knees. Maybe go to the cross and speak to someone today and say, I'd like to have Jesus as my Savior. You don't have to play the part. Ask him to develop your heart. May the Lord our God bless you. May he cause his face to shine on you. May our God who loves you lift up his countenance upon you, filling you with his grace and granting you his peace. Go into the world. Let God love you. Love him in return. Love others in Jesus' name. Go be the church. Amen.